All right, Brandy. Um, okay, you. welcome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we're going to be talking about raised bed basics. Um, I started my raised bed journey back in 2015. So these were my first three four foot by four foot uh, raised beds that I put in. And I was attracted to raised bed gardening because it didn't involve rototilling. So that was a plus. And it seemed just a much more manageable, manageable system than your traditional in the ground uh, gardening. So let's dive in. I wanted to start with a couple books that I highly recommend if you're going to really get into raised bed gardening. The first is uh, the square foot gardening method. Um, some of the titles are different. It's by Mel Bartholomew. He is the founder of the square foot gardening method. There are several versions and editions of his book available. The Nioga library system has several different copies, so I would highly recommend uh, checking one out and exploring that further. The second book I highly recommend um, is The Raised Bed Revolution by Tara Nolan. She is a Canadian gardener and she was super inspired by this raised bed movement that's happening right now. And she put together a really beautiful book full of inspiration and um, pretty unique construction building plans. So if you wanna construct your own raised bed that has a little bit more flair than just your standard four by four box, I definitely would check this book out. And Batavia Richmond Memorial Library does have a copy of this book. So if you are a library member, you can check that out. These are several of the other resources that I used to put this presentation together. I figured I would go ahead and list them now in case anyone needs to jump off early. Um, you'll have a better sense of what I used to put this together and you can do your own research further. Um, basically, if you Google raised bed garden and uh, extension, you'll come up with many different fact sheets from cooperative extensions all over the country on raised bed gardens. These were my um, favorites so far. And Jan will be sending these out after the presentation. Okay, so what are raised beds? They are nothing new. They, humans have been growing in raised beds for hundreds of years, and they basically can come in two different forms. So there's the mounded, freestanding form and the structured form. Your mounted form is basically you build up the soil of the bed six to 12 inches, and then you're gonna add two to three inches of organic material compost on top of that. And they're typically three to four feet wide by however long you need them to be. But what happens is these beds will settle over time. And so you have to rebuild them every year. The structured bed is uh, built from a durable material that actually holds the soil in place. So it's a little bit more permanent. Um, you don't have to rebuild the uh, raised bed every year. And there are many reasons why you would want to choose raised bed gardening over traditional in the ground gardening. Um, some of the reasons are if you have really poor soil, uh, maybe due to soil compaction, uh, maybe it doesn't drain well. If you know that the soil has been contaminated in any way, raised beds are all a really good solution to those problems. Another uh, reason would be maybe mobility. You have the ability to elevate raised beds and that helps you so you don't have to get down on the ground and do all your planting and weeding. Um, so accessibility is a big advantage. And quite frankly, some gardeners just like the aesthetic of how they look. They're very reminiscent of the uh, kitchen gardens in France and throughout Europe and have that uh, aesthetic appeal. But the advantages that you wanna think about are 
It's a solution to poor or no soil. So say your best location for sunlight is on your driveway, your asphalt driveway, you could build on top of that. Um, the soil warms up quickly in the spring. So you're able to get in the ground and start, um, well, in the bed and start gardening sooner than you would in an in the ground garden. They drain really well. Uh, they don't require any tilling. They're typically easier to maintain and keep weed free. And they are super efficient when it comes to yield. So you can pack a lot of plants in and get a lot of yield out of a small space. And like I said before, they can be built at a higher level so you don't have to be kneeling and bending on the ground. Some of the disadvantages are the upfront labor and cost. So clearly they can cost a little bit more money and investment to get started. Um, so you have to be willing to um, put that first. And the soil does dry out quickly if the weather is hot and dry. So you will end up watering and checking on the moisture level more than an in the ground garden. They tend to be permanent. Um, you know, you can kind of shift around your garden and your yard if you're rototilling, but once you pretty much put the beds in place, it would be a lot of effort to move them. And there's more labor involved if your garden is going to be on a slope. Uh, you have to kind of level those beds out. So you've decided that you're going to try a raised bed. You still need to select a location and that doesn't change whether it's a raised bed or in the ground. If you wanna grow vegetables, you wanna choose a location that receives six to eight hours of full sun. Most of your vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, um, all of those want full eight, you know, six to eight hours of sun. You also wanna consider where your water source is located because they do dry out faster. So you don't wanna be hauling water from really far away. You might want to consider maybe setting up drip irrigation. So how far away um, can you run a hose to the garden? And you don't want to make your beds wider than three and a half to four feet. Um, you want to be able to reach in from all sides um, if they're square. And you don't want to be stepping in the bed to get to those plants or to pull those weeds. And if you're building more than one bed, you want to consider leaving space in between them for um, your wheelbarrow, for kneeling down, um, maybe pulling a wagon through. So plan that out um, as you're positioning your beds. And if they are on a slope, I definitely would recommend leveling them out. So this photo shows how you would kind of bury that higher um, section of the bed into the slope. And I would recommend it. My garden is on a bit of a slope. And when I do water by hand, all of the water, you know, kind of runs downhill to one end of the bed. If you're placing the beds over grass, you can use cardboard to smother the grass instead of um, digging it up. You know, if you put a heavy layer of cardboard down, that will go ahead and smother the grass. If you do have a lot of perennial weed pressure, you're going to want to probably put landscape fabric down so that those weeds don't come up into your bed. Okay, you chose your location, you've got full sun, and now you get to think about what materials you want to build your bed out of. And there are a ton of choices to choose from. We're gonna take a look at um, some of the various ones, but I just want to put it out there that you have to feel comfortable with the material that you're choosing. Um, it's a personal choice. As long as you feel comfortable growing edible, uh, plants and garden um, plants in this bed it's and it fits in your budget, then that is your choice and only you can make that. So let's take a look at some of these materials in depth. So first we have wood. That is by far probably the most common um, material that people build the raised beds out of. And the best choice for lumber would be a naturally rot resistant wood. Um, that could be cedar, hemlock, um, Osage orange, black locust, black walnut. 
Sometimes these materials are harder to find and oftentimes they are the most expensive uh, building material when it comes to lumber. So they should last you a very long time. So your money should be worth the investment. Um, but if you just don't have it in your budget to uh, invest in those materials, you can consider pressure treated wood. There has been a debate um, about using pressure treated wood. However, in 2004, they stopped treating wood with the chemical that had the arsenic um, as the main ingredient. It was known as CCA. So I wouldn't use, I wouldn't repurpose old lumber that you think may have been pressure treated. I would skip that. And the new solution is based with, um, it's treated with a copper based chemical. It's known as ACQ. So you would want to look for that. There's usually a little label on the end of the lumber that could tell you how the wood was treated. There has been studies, uh, there have been a few studies done that uh, research whether that copper chemical is leaching into the soil and whether the plants are absorbing it. So far, it's shown to leach out a very small amount of that chemical and the plants absorb a very small amount of that chemical. So again, that's a personal choice that you have to decide on. I would not use railroad ties. Most railroad ties have been treated with uh, creosote and that can cause damage to the plants um, just from them touching the wood or I believe it would leach into the soil. So I would not use railroad ties. You can um, build different uh, styles of raised bed out of wood. This one shows you how you can stack up the frames to make a more elevated bed. Um, you just wanna make sure that you support uh, the corners and support the layers. So they're not gonna shift on you if you lean on them. Um, you can create a false bottom before you fill them with soil. You can either make a false bottom with um, plywood, or um, I've also seen people put old like plastic tubs upside down or five gallon pails inside to kind of take up some of that space so you need less soil to fill that uh, raised bed. You just wanna make sure you have at least a foot of um, unblocked soil on, on the top for the plant roots. You can repurpose old tree logs. Um, they will hold up for a while. They'll disintegrate and uh, you know, decompose over time, but that would surely hold the soil in place temporarily. You can use stacking timber. Um, you would either want to notch out the corners so you can make a nice um, stack, or you would wanna make sure to secure those corners. You can think outside of squares and rectangles and get super creative and build different shapes. Um, I thought that this uh, circular one was pretty neat out of a, a company out of Canada and the hexagon shape is really fun too. And it looks like they built it at different levels. Stone is our next material and fieldstone, landscape pavers, um, old bricks, cinder blocks, you know, they're all um, stone materials that you can use and stack up. Again, you just want to make sure that they're stable. They tend to be pretty permanent once you get them into place. So make sure you choose a really uh, good location. The only um, note that I saw about cinder blocks or cement blocks is that they could possibly contain fly ash, which is a byproduct of the coal um, industry and it has some pretty nasty chemicals in it. So I would see if maybe, you know, you can confirm that the blocks are purely made out of uh, concrete um, or cement. And just remember that uh, concrete materials will leach lime into the soil. So that will raise your soil pH over time. So you might want to check that and see if you need to, um, you know, add um, any thing to bring up or to lower that pH. Metal is another option. 
Um, they have some really neat uh, metal kits available now that you can uh, purchase. They do have wood kits available too, where you can go ahead and, and buy all the pre-cut, you know, wood kits and corners and everything to put together. Um, the metal is usually um, powder coated. Um, you can also use uh, livestock stock tanks um, or water troughs. And again, you would probably want to create some sort of false bottom if you don't want to fill the entire thing with soil. They're very long lasting. The only downside to the metal uh, raised beds is that they can, they do heat up fast. And in the, the heat of the summer, they could be too hot for some of your crops, you know, like lettuce and spinach and those types of things. So you want to stick with um, heat loving crops such as tomatoes, peppers, melons. So these photos were sent into the Master Gardener Helpline by Howard Sinclair. And it looks like he has a really nice setup. Um, he's got a wooden a raised bed over here and he's got several of the stock tanks set up and he's got some drip irrigation going. I think these are onions and some peas. So it's, it's nice to see how people are utilizing these materials. Other materials, um, grow bags are really popular right now. They're made out of, um, you know, a, a breathable, drainable fabric material. They're reusable, they come in different shapes and sizes and colors. And the cool thing about the grow bags is they air prune the roots. So the plants um, stay healthier, they don't get root bound. And you can grow a lot of different things in the grow bags, especially if you're gonna choose patio or container varieties of plants. And um, I've even seen some of the grow bags that come with a trellis so you can grow a climbing tomato um, in it. And it's just another uh, inexpensive option to get you growing. Five gallon buckets can be another option. Um, when I first started gardening, we were renting and we had a stone patio. So I um, invested in a bunch of five gallon buckets. You want to make sure you have proper drainage. And if they are on, um, say, like a hard or stone surface, you might want to elevate the buckets so that they can properly drain or make sure you have drainage along the uh, sides here. And I still actually grow in buckets, um, even though I have raised beds now, I still like to grow uh, peppers in, in five gallon buckets. And you could just be creative, you know, see, see what you have around, what can you turn into a raised bed. Um, this one is like a galvanized wash tub uh, that they put on some sawhorses. This one looks like it might be a cart from the laundromat. Um, you just want to remember to add drainage to whatever you're upcycling so that your, pan your plants don't get uh, waterlogged. So I thought for the purpose of this um, presentation, we would go through how to make the, ba the most basic four by four raised bed in case there's somebody that does wanna get started with this. And some of the tips for raised bed construction, the box uh, height, so your lumber height or depth should be six to 12 inches tall. Um, most vegetables are gonna need at least 10 inches and if, if your raised bed is shallower than that 10 inches, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's exposed to the ground beneath because most of those vegetable roots will wanna go into the actual ground. So if you know that your soil is not good there or you're gonna be putting it on a paved surface, make sure you aim for at least um, 12 inches high. You're gonna to wanna to alternate your corner joints when constructing the bed that ensures that you have a square bed, which makes it much easier when you're doing this, the square foot planting method. My first um, raised beds, we did not alternate the corners. So it gets quite annoying when you're trying to measure out and you don't have a perfectly square bed. You're gonna to wanna to turn the heartwood in. So on the end of the board, you'll see the rings curve. So you want those rings to curve in towards the inside of the bed. So as the board ages, it will bend into the bed like towards the soil. 
if you have that curve going out, it'll, it'll fold away from the bed. Um, it's not super important, but it does make a little bit of a difference depending on how the boards, how much they warp. And you're gonna wanna use a center support. So say you're building a four foot by eight foot long bed, you wanna make sure you put a support in the center of that board so it doesn't blow out um, from the weight of the soil. And you can use additional support for the corners. They make metal strapping at the hardware store. They're like little corner brackets that you can attach to each board. And then they actually sell um, these raised bed corners that are really nice too. So you basically just slide your boards in and drill them in place. So your supplies, you will need a drill and some drill bits. You want a drill bit to um, be a little bit smaller than the screws that you're gonna use. You can pre-drill those holes. You're gonna need 20 coarse threaded, two and a half inch galvanized or treated deck screws. <coughs> Excuse me. You're gonna need two 10, um, two inch by 10 inch, eight foot long pieces of lumber. And you're gonna to wanna to have that cut by the lumber yard. Excuse me just for a minute. <clears throat> so most places like Home Depot will cut the lumber for you. My asthma is bothering me today. Excuse me just for a minute. And then you're gonna want cardboard or weed cloth to put on the bottom of the bed. So you're gonna stack your boards in a pile and pre-drill four to five holes on each end of one of the boards or on one end of all of the boards. So you're gonna put your boards together and attach them end to end. So you'll use the, the end of the board that you've pre-drilled the holes, you'll put against the board, the next board without the holes. I have a better photo in the next slide. And place your bed in its location. So this is a really great example. They alternated the corners of this bed. So you have your pre-drilled holes here and you screw into the unpre-drilled section of this board. You have your pre-drilled pre -drilled holes here and you screw into the unpre-drilled uh, section of this board and continue around and that will ensure that you have a square bed. They also attached a grid with um, screw-in eyelets with twine. And this grid is super helpful if you're gonna use the square foot gardening method. You can also create this grid out of lattice, wooden lattice, um, but I really like the, the string, it um, takes up less space. So you need soil mix to fill these beds. And you need to determine how much you need to fill it. So there is, there are calculators online, these square foot garden uh, website has a soil calculator and there is a formula. So you multiply the length by the width by the depth, and that will give you your cubic feet. However, the calculations have to be done in feet. So the bed that we were building was only 10 inches wide. So we divide 10 by 12 to get this 0.83. So our calculation would mean that we need 13.28 cubic feet of soil. 
which I would round to 13.5 because the soil is going to settle after time. So now that you've figured out how many cubic feet of soil you need, you want to come up with your options of, do you want to pre-buy it? Do you want to make it yourself? You can purchase pre-made raised bed mix. I've seen it um, in some of the stores. It's, um, I think it's a little pricey. And you want to make sure it's a combination of peat moss, compost, and perlite. If you wanted to make your own mix, uh, Mel Bartholomew has a recipe for a soilless mix that he highly recommends. It's one third blended compost, one third peat moss, or coconut choir if you don't, if you wanna be more um, environmentally friendly, that is a sustainable choice. And then one third perlite or vermiculite. Perlite is the white, uh, the little white chunks that you see in potting mix. Vermiculite is, um, it's more of a shine, the shiny uh, little flakes. They're, they're much uh, thinner texture. And you can buy both perlite and vermiculite from garden supply uh, stores in bigger, bigger volume. So Mel's mix is based on volume and not weight. So if you calculate that out, you would need 4.5 cubic feet of each of those components, the compost, the peat moss, and the perlite. If you want to skip Mel's mix, you can also do a blend of 40% topsoil, 40% compost, and then a 10% uh, coarse drainage material. You can use the sand, uh, no finer than builder's grade, vermiculite, or a perlite. I would just be really cautious of where you purchase your topsoil from. Make sure it's, it's a reputable um, dealer. You don't want it to be full of weed seeds. You want it to be a clean, a clean soil. And then you're gonna amend and top dress your um, raised bed every year with compost. So when you're mixing your, if you're gonna mix your own ingredients, it's um, a good way to do that is to use a five gallon bucket. So for Mel's mix, you would um, mix a five gallon bucket of each, the compost, the peat moss and the perlite and put it in maybe a wheelbarrow or on a tarp and get it mixed and get it moistened and then get it in your bed. You wanna mix and moisten as you add it to the bed. You want that soil to be thoroughly moist um, when, it's, when the bed is full. It's really hard to uh, get the peat moss to absorb if you put it all in dry. Drip irrigation is a super handy uh, tool when it comes to raised bed gardening. You know, at first it's not too bad, you, you know, you water it, but then come the heat of the summer, you just, it gets old really fast. So they've come up with um, many new systems uh, for a raised bed irrigation. This is the sip and drip raised bed uh, connection system through gardener supply. They also have a smaller raised bed drip line kit. Um, it looks like it's just for a single bed and it has a little soaker hose that you can run through. Uh, this is a kit from dripworks.com and um, they have different kits available that you can um, purchase, you have a small, medium, large, you can order your own parts. Um, they have some really helpful videos um, on how to uh, get that put together. And I'm sure if you're super handy, you can come up with your own system at the plumbing store. So now I wanted to talk about planting. And there are many different planting methods and techniques, and they each deserve more time and attention than I can give them in this talk. But I wanted to outline them just the bare basics to um, give you some information and some research. And if one really sparks your interest, 
definitely feel free to um, research it further. If you need assistance with that, feel free to contact the Master Gardener Helpline and they can um, help you get some more information on these. So we're gonna cover quickly square foot, the square foot method, interplanting, succession planting, companion planting, and polyculture planting. So interplanting, succession, companion, and polyculture, they're all very similar, but they each have a little, a little difference to them. Remember when you are planting your raised bed to think about your end plant heights. What, is, what are their final plant heights? Put the taller plants to the north. If you're trellising something, put the trellis to the north. That way it's not gonna cast a shadow on your smaller plants in the front. And also if you're building more than one raised bed, if it does suit your space, um, you know, arrange the beds uh, from north to south so that you get the most um, sunlight out of it going across the sky. Also follow the spacing directions. So you're gonna put in your tiny little plants and they're gonna look like you could add more and you have way more space than you thought, but they do fill in very quickly. So try to stick to those spacing recommendations. So the square foot gardening method, this method really allows you to maximize the space of a raised bed. What it does is it eliminates the row spacing. So say on the back of your seed packet, you're gonna plant um, radishes and it tells you you're gonna plant your radishes two inches apart within the row and you're gonna leave eight inches or a foot in between each row. Mel basically tells you, forget about that eight to 10 inches between the rows and focus on planting those radishes in a block. So you would fill that block two by two by two by two with radishes. This is a little two foot by two foot example so it shows you that they've got 16 carats in the square foot. Um, I think these are beets, 12 little beets, one tomato and some corn, four, four corn plants in a foot. You wanna try to stick with container or patio varieties just because they're more compact, they're better suited for growing in small spaces. If you do grow, um, regular uh, heirloom tomatoes, try to do the uh, indeterminate tomatoes that you can train up on a single stem versus a determinate bush tomato. They will need more, more squares. You're gonna need two to three squares for a, a bush variety tomato. And then this photo is a really nice example of how they actually planted the one foot squares in this, this raised bed. So here are just a, a few more examples. This is a four foot by eight foot uh, raised bed. And you wanna choose what you like to grow. Um, don't grow what you think you should grow or, you know, oh, everyone grows tomatoes, but you don't really like tomatoes. Then don't grow tomatoes. Grow what you want to eat and enjoy. So they've got, you know, onions, tomatoes, and it's good to plant it out like this. That's the benefit of raised bed gardening too, is you can get your graph paper out, put on paper your actual dimensions of your square foot bed and pick out how many crops you can fit. This is another example. Um, and they have some squash in here. Uh, cucumbers, which I think they would have a trellis over here to grow um, the cucumber on. And it looks like they have uh, the peppers and, uh, oh, it's a snack cucumber. So it must be it doesn't grow as tall. And they're in tomato cages. Again, adding vertical support is really easy in the raised bed. You can either make your own trellis, you can add um, attach it to the back. You can get trailing plants that go over the side. So def definitely maximize your space. So now we have interplanting. So interplanting is a technique where you plant two plants together, kind of within the same area. So you're going to pair maybe a slow growing plant um, that takes longer to get taller and put a faster 
quick growing plant underneath it and plants, you know, in your plant within it. Um, also plants with different root patterns. So something with deeper roots, something with shallower roots, we're not gonna compete. They're gonna intergrow together. This one is a row of peas and they have interplanted some lettuce in the front of it. And then this plant, uh, I believe is tomatoes and they have some nasturtiums underneath that go and they trail off over the side of the bed. So session planting is sowing and harvesting multiple crops throughout the season. So you basically want to have a continuous harvest all season. And one way to do this is to do cool season crops and transition into warm season crops. Another method is to plant small patches of the vegetables every two weeks. So instead of sowing the entire bed full of lettuce one time, you would pick your little squares, your one foot squares, and so a block of lettuce this week, a block of radishes, and then a couple more weeks and more lettuce. So you have a continuous harvest and not just this mass of vegetables all at once that you can't possibly eat. This is a square foot bed where some of the cool weather crops have already been harvested and replanted. So um, the squash in the upper left, um, has been replanted where a cool crop was growing and has already been harvested. And then they re sowed some stuff down here. Companion planting is the practice of growing two or more plant species in proximity to each other because they have the ability to either enhance or complement each other's growth. Maybe they um, attract beneficial insects or repel pests. Uh, an example would be tomatoes um, are companions with the onion family, nasturtiums, marigolds, asparagus, carrots, parsley, cucumber. Some of this is back, it dates back to kind of folklore. Uh, the companion, um, you'll see a lot of companion planting charts. They aren't necessarily research proven. However, there are definitely incompatible plants that you that you don't want to grow together. Um, like with tomatoes, you don't want to pair them with potatoes because they both can get the um, blight very easily. Um, also cabbage, the cabbage family is said to not work well with tomatoes and give them kind of a funky taste. Um, this hill, this homestead in chill, they were having problems with their Swiss chard. They were getting a lot of aphids. So they planted onions in and around their Swiss chard and they, they actually did not have a problem with aphids that year. So if you wanna get more into companion planting, there's a lot of charts, um, check that out and, and see what will work for you. Polyculture planting is a technique in which you plant a variety of crops together and you treat that area as its own ecosystem. So the plants are benefiting each other and the whole of that little ecosystem. The Three Sisters Trio is an example of a polyculture planting. So the corn provides support for the beans to grow up. The beans fix nitrogen to the soil for the corn and the squash provides a ground cover to uh, prevent weeds and to shade the corn's um, roots to keep them cool. So you want to uh, think about having a mixture of different plants together. This one was a beneficial mixture of squash, calendula, marigolds, and basil. And really, if you think about it, if you're doing a raised bed and planting the square foot method, you are creating a little polyculture uh, garden because you're going to have most likely more than one type of plant together. So some final tips, start small. Just start with one bed, two bed, and see how it goes. Um, it's less intimidating if you start small, you set yourself up for more success if you start small. And experiment, take notes, 
If you don't want to um, build a bed or you're not, or you don't have a location in your yard that gets enough hours of sunlight, maybe consider uh, looking into a community garden. The city of Batavia has um, raised beds available to rent for a very low fee throughout the season. I think Virgin has a community garden as well. And you wanna try to rotate your crops. Um, I didn't really get into this uh, heavily in the, the planting section, but you do, you do wanna try to rotate your crops. So say you only have room for one raised bed. Well, how do I rotate my crops? Well, maybe incorporate some of the grow bags or the five gallon buckets. So, you know, one year you're growing your tomatoes in your raised bed, the next year you're growing in, in the five gallon bucket or a grow bag just to, swap up where you're growing those crops. It really does lessen the pest and disease pressure over time if you can rotate your crop plantings. Clean up your garden in the fall. If you have time, try a cover crop. It is best to not leave the soil bare over the winter. So maybe you mulch it with um, shredded leaves, um, it is, it is okay, it happens. I don't mulch all of my beds, but if you can keep the soil covered, it is beneficial. And think about maybe adding season extension. If you really wanna get into raised bed gardening and try to really maximize the season that we have here in New York, there's a really um, nice book out now called Growing Undercover by Nikki Jabor. And she's a Canadian grower that actually grows 12 months out of the year using um, little poly tunnels that she sets up on her raised beds and cold frames. So there's a lot of different things that you can do um, with the raised bed garden. And just have fun because that's, you know, that's the most benefit of it is enjoying the entire process. So this is what my garden actually grew into. So these are my little three raised beds that uh, got me started in 2015. And um, this was from uh, not last year, maybe the year before. This is what my garden has expanded into. It definitely is a super enjoyable hobby and uh, you might get bitten by the raised bed bug and want to build 10 more. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we did have one question in the chat, Brandy. You have to wash the coconut core to remove salt. Oh, you do? I don't, do you? I don't think so. I, I think that- um, She's asking if you have to. I would check the packaging. I have not yet purchased it. I've, I have been wanting to purchase it to try it. Um, but I, as far as I have seen in garden catalogs where they sell it in the brick, it looks like you soak it, um, you do soak it in a bucket of water for a certain amount of hours. So that might release any um, salt that is in it. But I think that, it, that they're pre-washed and ground and dehydrated and packed together. So I think it just probably depends on how, it, how it's processed. I would check the packaging. All right. Oh, we got a bunch of print, um, questions coming in. Okay. All right. What other layers would you recommend other than the compost, if any? Layers as in? What other layers would you recommend other than the compost? Not sure what Krista means. Maybe, maybe like top dressing. Krista, if you want to unmute, you can, you can explain what you mean. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, what I was asking was, um, I've seen some articles mention mulch or other layers outside of just the compost, compost that you create, um, other combinations of soil to just creating layers on top of the cardboard or whatever's covering the grass. Or would you just oh. put like the, the cardboard compost and that's it? So, so, um, so you actually want to, you either want to buy pre, pre-made soil. So you either want to buy like bags of um, potting mix or raised bed mix. If not, you want to create your own mix. And, and that would be a combination of either doing, you know, the third um, method where it's one third perlite, one third peat moss, one third compost. And that is your actual soil mix. So that is what you're filling your bed with on top of the cardboard. 
And then um, every year, either in the spring or the fall, you would, it, the, the soil is gonna settle. And so you're gonna want to um, top dress that bed with compost. I don't know, I wouldn't do it with mulch because it, it's not gonna add uh, the nutrients back into the soil. The compost is gonna add those nutrients back in every year. Perfect, thank you. That answers your question. You're welcome. And the other thing that comes to mind um, Brandy and Krista is lasagna gardening in the raised bed. I mean, if you're going to build, especially if you do it in the fall, you could do like lasagna gardening to do your, your layers. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how long it would take, take to, to break, break down, to break down. I don't know a lot about, um, lasagna gardening. <laughs> well, we but, could go back and look at, <laughs> I think look at Dar's presentation. We'll have to ask Dar, but, um, yeah, I know some of the things because in lasagna garden, you can almost plant immediately because you put topsoil on the top and then it breaks down over time. Okay. So I think if you were doing raised bed building in the fall, that would be good for, for lasagna gardening. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because it would have time to kind of, you know, break down over the do winter. Thing. Yeah. Okay. So Rebecca's asking you, what do you use for ground cover in your garden? Um. So in... In my raised beds, um, I put them right on top of the grass in our yard and I did put down a heavy layer of cardboard um, and then I filled it with Mel's mix. However, I've come to uh, find out that our yard is um, heavily infested with bindweed and it does come up through um, the soil. Um, I just keep pulling it. Um, so I would say if, if you know, if you know you have something like bindweed in, in your planting area, I, I would have probably used a, um, a heavier landscape fabric, but then I would have also done deeper, taller beds so that I know that my plants have enough root space. Um, my beds are, they vary between the 10 inches and eight inches. Um, so I know that some of the roots are making it down into the, into the soil. And I think you have a lot of mulch between your beds, right? Brandy? So yeah, I forgot to cover that. So you want to consider, you know, what do you want to put in between? Do you want to just keep it grass and mow around your beds? Um, do I like mulch. So I laid down landscape fabric and, and use cedar mulch um, in my raised bed area. Um, if you wanted to use stone, um, straw, it, it's up to you, your budget and, and your personal preference for that. All right, so Catherine writes that you answered her question about rotating crops. I know that's always a Yeah, I try well. now, like now I have enough beds um, that I try to rotate my, my crops every third year. So my tomatoes come back to a bed after it, they've been empty for two years. All right, and Cheryl, we don't normally share our slides. We are recording it, so we will, it will be up on YouTube. So you'll be able to go in and and watch the YouTube again and stop it and pause it. And if there's something you need to write down and Brandy will be sending out um, the resource list that was at the beginning. Did we get everybody else's questions? Anybody else have a question? If you want, you could un unmute. I don't see anything else coming in. Oh, okay, that's a thank you. Yeah, so this really was a basic introduction to raised bed gardening and um and like just in, in, inspirational like there's many different options i mean you you don't you could do it any way basically you want and i'm sure there's more options out there um just to get you excited to try it right all right everybody as i said we do have a couple of classes coming up so i'll just run through them quick may 20th um, we're going to be talking about health strip planting that's that hard area to grow things in between, you know, your, the road and your sidewalk. If you live in the um, city or urban areas, June 3rd, our next garden talk will be playing in the dirt, the risks and benefits. We all have been hearing a lot of research about good things, but we also have to take into account there might be some risks. And then June 14th, um, we'll be talking about native plants for butterflies. And I think we're going to take a break in July and come back in August for our garden talk in August. So let me just check the chat and make sure 
we've got no more questions. Lots of thank you, Brandy. So I think we will we'll end the program there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks thank for joining you. us.